Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Hello and welcome to the Arizona Foundation's Bridge Forum, Mental Health Beyond the Stigma. This forum is part six and an addition to the Foundation's Time for Change 2020 series. This special segment includes leaders in the mental health industry and organizations that interact with residents with potential mental health related issues. Our mission at the Arizona Foundation is to create and empower heroes in our communities. Today, we're in zip code 85040, commonly referred to as 85040. We're here in downtown Phoenix at the newly renovated American Legion, Travis L. Williams, Post 65. Thank you to our post commander, Jarvis Reddick, and his team for hosting us today. And welcome to all of you online tuning in to our live stream from across the nation. I'm Ron Williams, president of the Arizona Foundation, U.S. Air Force veteran. I'm honored to serve as your master of ceremonies for this important forum today. We're very fortunate to have subject matter experts in the mental health industry with us today. We're honored to have retired 45th Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court with us to moderate today's forum. Let's welcome retired Chief Justice Scott Bales. Today's Bridge Forum is specifically designed to have discussions about mental health and how we can do better by our citizens experiencing mental health related issues. Earlier, I mentioned we're in zip code 84040. We will share the significance of this zip code when we get into our program. Today's panelists represent organizations within our mental health systems that interact and interface with citizens with mental health and deal with issues and incidents that occur as a result of mental illness. We are honored today that they've entrusted the Arizona Foundation with the privilege of hosting this important discussion. Many times mental illness and mental health are not discussed and are seen as taboo to talk about. We're going to talk about it today. We will formally introduce our panelists for our moderated panel discussion later, but in short, today we're honored to have with us Alistair Adele, Maricopa County Attorney, Barry Roska, Chief in Custody Detention, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, Judge Joseph Welty, Presiding Judge, Maricopa County Superior Court, Kelly Donnelly Williams, State Suicide Prevention Specialist at AHCCCS, and I'll, I'll, spell, I'll read that out later. <laughs> We also have Debbie Dominic, Chief Social Worker, Phoenix VA Medical Center, and Nikki Kuntz, Clinical Director of Team Lifeline. Now, our PR firm, Evolve Public Relations and Marketing, informed us that the potential audience for this event is 5.4 million people. So we know the topic is, is, is important. To our distinguished panelists, Thank you. We can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us today to share your voice and your expertise. The Arizona Foundation believes that we all have a shared sense of duty to do our part. Our mantra in this series is not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So we're going to face the stigma around mental health today. A big thanks to everyone who supports the Arizona Foundation and the work we do today's Sponsors and supporters include AP and Associates LLC, strategic partners represented by Chairman Alan A.P. Powell, Aaron Bear, and Company represented by CEO Aaron Bear, Vitania Brain Performance Centers represented by Michael Southworth, Maricopa County represented by County Supervisor Bill Gates, District 3, Greater Phoenix Leadership, Greater Phoenix Economic Council, Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Travis L. Williams Post 65. We also want to thank Mint Social, Golden Rule Live, and our PR firm, Evolve Public Relations and Marketing, and of course, our production team and partners, SWAT HD. Last but not least, the Arizona Foundation, we're honored to have our founders here with us today. Alan A.P. Powell, Chairman of AP and Associates and Strategic Partners, and Aaron Bear, CEO of Aaron Bear and Company. We certainly want to thank our foundation advisory board members Represented by those supporting this forum, advisory board members Heath McCarter, Dennis Prince, Rashonda Carnes, Matt O'Brien, and myself, Ron Williams. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a special thanks to Scottsdale Police Chief Alan Rodbell 
and of course Mayor Jim Lane, they have been key to our success in this entire 2020 series. So we want to thank them. Let's please give our sponsors and supporters a big round of applause. Now to provide welcoming remarks to Pulse 65 and to introduce why we're in this location this morning uh, is the second vice commander and U.S. Army Gulf War veteran. He's the chairman of AP and Associates Strategic Alliances. He founded the Heroes on the Foundation along with Aaron Baer and both still remain available to help me and our advisory board members when we call on them. Please welcome American Legion Pulse 65 second vice commander Alan A.P. Powell. Ron, you took everything I was going to say, <laughs> so I'm just going to keep it short. I just want to thank everybody. I know you could be a lot of places this morning. Really appreciate you coming for such a needed topic conversation. Uh, we have a lot of people in here from all walks of life. Uh, I want a special thanks to Jeff Garner. Uh, if you see this place, it looks like this because of Jeff's leadership, and Jeff also is on the board of uh, Greater Phoenix Leadership and GPEC. He's been instrumental, and he's a member here also, and he's a Navy veteran, so I appreciate you, Jeff. But I just want to say to everybody, uh, this is dear to my heart because I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I see the things that go on in this community. And my pastor challenged me. He's over there right now, Pastor Warren Stewart Sr. And he challenged me about 8540. And uh, I'm going to share some with everybody so you can see why we're here today. Uh, the statistics just touched my heart, and it made me want to do something uh, to be a part of the solution and uh, just make sure I can make a difference. I also want to thank uh, my good friend, uh, Colonel Wanda Wright, uh, she's been instrumental and been very supportive of this post, and we wouldn't be able to do some of this stuff without her, uh, with her leadership and her relationships, because uh, she cares about the veterans. Uh, she served our country, and she retired, and now she's still leading on the front line and serving our community, working for ADVS as the leader. Uh, so other than that, I just want to say thank you once again. Uh, Ron, we can show the video to kind of set the tone while we're here today. And there's also a young man here, Omar Bill. He's one of the reasons why I do what I do, because... I saw a, guy, a kid like him make it all the way through to this side of town and get his, he's working on his master's ASU now, and he works for the state. Uh, Leah Landra has been very supportive of him also. Thank you. I'm going to give you an assignment, and I hope you will have made progress on it by King Day 2020. Here's the assignment. I want you to lift, lower, smooth, and straighten starting with zip code 8504. Mr. Hamilton, this is, this is zip code 8504. And I'm giving you an assignment on this King Day that you will lift, lower, smooth, and straighten wherever you live, Paradise Valley, Moon Valley, uh, Casa Grande, wherever you live, I'm giving you an assignment because every one of you here can contribute to lifting, lowering, smoothing, and straightening right here in zip code 85040. This zip code is the most historically African American and Latino zip code in our state. There are his, There's history here. Uh, at one time, most of the African Americans in Phoenix had to live in this zip code because there was segregated uh, housing and neighborhoods. Uh, the median income in this district is significantly lower than any other zip code in this state. It is about $31,000, and for a family of four, that is either in the poverty level or is just above it. The test scores in the public schools here are below average. Virtually all of the schools in this district are close to failing when the schools are tested. The largest concentration of African Americans have lived in this district, and it is above the state average. It has one of the highest crime rates in the city of Phoenix. 
it has more renters here than homeowners than many other zip codes it has the highest rate of formerly incarcerated people who get out of prison they come back to 85040 it has one of the lowest rates of African Americans registered to vote in zip code 85040 and it has one of the highest mortality rates of African Americans in the entire county African Americans lead eight lead seven of eight reasons for mortality even though we're only 5% of the population of the county we lead in seven of eight reasons why people die. The only one we don't lead in is suicide. I want to challenge you. This is your assignment. That you, everybody in here, you've heard just some of the statistics of this neighborhood. That you lift lower, smooth and straighten so that some of these statistics have been changed by 12 months from this day. Thank you, AP, uh, for all you do in Hero, Arizona. Thank you, Travis L. Williams, uh, American Legion, Post 65, for all that you do. Uh, and for all of the leaders who are here, all of the community people who are here, uh, thank you for taking time out of your uh, King Day celebration afternoon to be here and to share with us. Thank you, Pastor Stewart, for that challenge. We appreciate that challenge. And it's because of that challenge that we're here in this beautifully renovated location today. I also want to thank Zach Jerome with the Maricopa County staff of uh, Bill Gates. Uh, thanks for your support. Uh, now, for our opening remarks, we welcome to the stage Aaron Baer, CEO of Aaron Baer and the Company. He's a strategy and innovative consultant and a serial entrepreneur author of his new book, I, I saw him do some book signings earlier today, uh, for his new book, Reimagining Innovation. He has a vast background in the tech industry, holds an MBA in global management from Thunderbird School. Please welcome Mr. Aaron Baer. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> so over the past few months, leadership has taken on a whole new perspective. What I've learned from my privileged viewpoint, when people are angry, listen with empathy. When people are critical, listen with empathy. And when people are in pain, listen with empathy. I think we've created a different moment than we've ever seen before, as I actually see all of you here starting to listen with empathy. Yet what I'm about to share with you may shock some of you, and others will say, it's about time we started talking about this subject. Mental health is the next pandemic. The UN reports that mental health and well-being of whole societies has been severely impacted by the COVID crisis and a priority to be addressed urgently. The American Mental Health Counselors Association is projecting 100 million Americans will experience a mental health disorder in 2020 alone. Over 115 million people live in the United States in designated areas called health professional shortage areas. These are areas with a ratio of mental health professionals to residents smaller than one to 30,000. In fact, more than 50% of all U.S. counties have no mental health professionals at all, according to the Washington Post. To focus on law enforcement, a recent study found that police officers have 69% higher risk of suicide than the general population. 85% of first responders have reported mental health symptoms. 35% reported clinical diagnosis of depression or PTSD. Beyond law enforcement, everyone should now be aware that 22 veterans on average are taking their life each day. We are a society reaching out for help with very little resources reaching back out. 
Yet today, we have some champions for that cause in the room. There are a few who have been fighting this battle against mental health for many, many years. For those that lead companies, the World Health Organization estimates one trillion in lost productivity due to mental health issues per year. I hope these facts have your attention because as AP and I created the Bridge Forum to have difficult conversations and get necessary people in the room to make systemic changes. The right, these are some of the pressing issues in the world and the health of human beings, their civil rights, and mental health should be on the top of that list. We must learn to be human again, to forgive, to love, to listen, to take care of each other, to listen with empathy. We need to recognize the call for help, law enforcement's crying for help, the community crying for help, and we all can do better than this. I hope that each of you can lean into this conversation and may Godspeed take you to act upon what you learn here today. On behalf of the Arizona Board, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Aaron. Yes. Some of that was shocking to me. Thank you for sharing that with us. Next on our agenda, we will have our invocation, followed by the singing of the national anthem, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by SAL Commander Dennis Prince. As you stand for the national anthem, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Now for our invocation, Reverend Karen Stewart, received her bachelor's degree from Ottawa University, her master's degree from Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, and is completing her doctor of ministry degree at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. She's an active member of the First Institutional Baptist Church and holds the position of Director of Evangelism and Discipleship. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Karen Stewart. Good morning to everyone. What a privilege it is to be able to come and pray, especially in light of the topic that we're getting ready to discuss. So let's bow our heads in prayer. God, we do thank you always for the opportunity that we have to come together. God, I thank you for the HeroZona Foundation, for bringing public, private sectors together, for bringing politicians and the police together, for bringing mental health and educational people together to discuss this topic. I pray, God, that we are more than bothered by what we hear today. I pray, God, that it moves us to do something about what we hear. We've heard already some of the statistics, not only for this zip code, but across this state as it affects people, people of color and all people regarding mental health. I pray for the persons who are watching this broadcast who might be a little nervous about the topic. God, many of us have someone in our family who has a mental health issue that has not been managed through the healthcare system, but has been managed through the penal system. God, would you help us open our ears so that we might hear you a little better, so that we can do better by the people you have under our charge. God, I pray somebody is listening to this contemplating suicide. Somebody is listening to this who is being torn apart by so many things going on through this pandemic. Somebody's listening, God, and today they're going to hear hope. So I pray, God, that that hope will manifest itself into a system of change so that people's lives can be made better. So I thank you, God, for this opportunity for conversation today that will lead to change. It is in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that I do pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet away oh the land of the free and the home of the brave pledge of allegiance SAL Commander Dennis Prince. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you, SAL Commander for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and thank you, Reverend Stewart, for your powerful, powerful invocation. Next on our agenda, we have Mr. Harold Branch III. We call him HB. He's a speaker, trainer, entrepreneur, and poet, and a proud Phoenix resident. His life story was featured in an MTV documentary. He is the founder of one of the country's largest open mic poetry events called Home Based Poetry. We can't thank him enough for taking the time to join us again to share his amazing talents. As a doctoral student, I'm excited for him as he enters the home stretch in becoming a doctor. To share a piece called My Mother's Son, please welcome Harold Branch III. Greetings and good morning. Good morning. This topic is so dear to me and it's something that I've been working to release the stigma of for since I was a teenager. It's something I've struggled with. When I was two, I lost my mother to suicide. And this topic has not been addressed nearly enough, especially in the black community and communities of color. So I'm grateful for the conversation and hopefully massive resources that will be put in this direction. So this is a poem that I wrote during my struggle. Trying to win the campaign as governor of my own state of mind, I rewind time a little over 22 years to the day my mother realized she couldn't handle too many more tears. That life was a scandal and the future held many more fears. Her will to live candle was swiftly dimming. The grim reaper stood next to her grinning because they had been fighting for years and he knew he was finally winning. Like first snow, her emotional downfall was beginning. It was obvious she had a torn soul and not a thread of happiness to do the mending. Six million ways to die and one was chose. I'm sure she closed her eyes as the gun rose. The bullet made love to her mind as the August sun froze. She figured her three children be better off if she died and her dawn never again rose. And ever since I was two years old, I've asked, why did my mother have to go? And they always replied. No one really knows what was going through her mind or why she chose to redefine God's grand design. But that answer just wasn't adequate. My young heart just couldn't handle it. 
My thoughts became frantic until the day I accepted that my manic depression was genetic. My suicidal thoughts moved me like they was telekinetic, just like the one who birthed me. I am my mother's son, sweating in my sleep, dreaming about the ones who hurt me. No matter how I try to bless the world, it always seems to tease and curse me. Mama, I understand, because the same ones that worked you to the grave irk me to this day. I'm a grown, educated man. I know I shouldn't feel this way, but I often go to sleep wishing I just wouldn't wake up, and my heart is always confused and unstable, like I'm constantly recovering from a really bad breakup, and I'm insecure by my inner beauty, like an adolescent girl in puberty who just left the house wearing too much damn makeup. The towel isn't enough. I'm ready to throw in the entire linen closet and just give up. I am my mother's son, and I'm sure it breaks her heart that her baby boy doesn't want to breathe anymore. But opening my eyes is a chore. Pain, murder, and suffering I don't want to see anymore. So I invite death with my pen and walk through the world with a tight grin to hide the expression of depression. They say that life is a test. If so, I haven't been studying my lessons because I'm not prepared for these questions. They say when you die is when you get to do your resting. But I'm tired now. Everyone eventually expires from this world of desire. The only question is how. I can even narrow down when. Naturally, within the next 60 or so years. But by then, I will have lost 60 or so peers. Cried 60 million or so tears waiting for death to rear its ugly head. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and the grave is pretty attractive to a young man who thought he was a soldier, but now waits impatiently for his life to be over. I'm tired of carrying the world's drama boulders, my emotionally underdeveloped shoulders. The temperature of God's heart must be dropping steadily, because every day the world grows just a little bit colder, and I don't even want to grow just a little bit older. I'm tired of living in a place with no rules. I'm tired of trying to build a career and love life with no tools, like sending an obese man with bunions to a church with no pews. I can only stand for so long, and I hate myself, because my obituary must state that I never really planned to go wrong. I was merely the epitome of a man who couldn't go on, useless like an NFL quarterback who couldn't throw long. I'm the Kaiser Sose of falling down. Because one day, y'all look around and I'll be gone. Peace. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, HP. Next, I get the great pleasure to introduce our first special guest speaker, Rebecca Rios. Rebecca currently serves in the Arizona State Senate, representing District 27 since January 14, 2019. She pre previously served in the Arizona House of Representatives, including as Minority Leader. She previously served as Arizona State Senator for District 23 from 2004 to 2010 and served as Minority Whip. She was a previously a member of the Arizona House of Representatives from 1995 through 2001. Please join me in welcoming State Senator Rebecca Rios. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Arizona, and thank you for all of the sponsors that have made this very critical and timely discussion a possibility today. My hope is that this will be the first in an ongoing dialogue where law enforcement, the courts, behavioral health, and policymakers will continue to work together to come up with a multifaceted and collaborative approach to deal with the issue of mental health and the stigma associated with it. I've been in the legislature for many years, but prior to that and for two decades during my legislative tenure, I worked in Arizona's behavioral health system with children and families. 
And during this time, I was witness to things that worked and things that didn't. I was able to see that when we provided a concentrated and well-funded effort that included wrapping all necessary services around a family, that a family that was more stable and healthy could come of that. Unfortunately, during that time, I was also witness to a system that often diagnosed children of color, primarily boys, with a conduct disorder or an oppositional defiant disorder and referred them on to the juvenile court system. At the same time, however, non-children of color exhibiting the same behaviors were often diagnosed with mild depression or an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and were referred for residential treatment. Unfortunately, adequate funding remains a huge barrier to treating mental health issues and substance abuse issues. And substance abuse issues must also be a part, obviously, of this conversation because oftentimes mental health disorders co-occur with substance abuse orders when people do not receive the appropriate treatment they need. They often will self-medicate with alcohol and drugs and end up in our courts and our prisons. Once in Arizona's correctional facil facilities, we find that our prisons have little to no treatment services for inmates. Now, when we look within our own communities and across the country, we are witnessing strained relationships between communities and law enforcement. Healing these strained relationships is going to be one of the most pressing challenges we face as a country. Addressing the issue will take much work, and part of that needs to include increased funding for mental health and de-escalation training for law enforcement. But we must also acknowledge that the stigma around receiving mental health care is also present among our first responders. Law enforcement are witness to untold human devastation, and we need to ensure support for law enforcement, mental wellness, and officer suicide prevention. I think it's important that we recognize the deeply stressful job they perform and the mental health issues that can arise from that and how that can play out in relationships between law enforcement and our communities. I think we need to acknowledge that there is a lack of alternatives that citizens have to calling 911 when a loved one is in a mental health crisis. And once they do call 911, there is a lack of alternatives for those dispatch officers to provide something other than dispatching law enforcement to deal with mental health, mental health and substance abuse crises. At the end of the day, unfortunately, we do not have the appropriate systems in place to respond to all mental health and substance abuse crises. Clearly, our charge is complicated, it's complex, and properly addressing mental health and the stigma associated with it will require a coordinated effort between law enforcement, policymakers, behavioral health, and the courts. The reality is there is no single fix, and the only path to making progress for all of us is to earnestly engage in this difficult conversation with an agreement that the status quo is not working, but by achieving this together, I think we can, in fact, achieve real progress. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reels. Our next guest speaker is Russell Rusty Bowers. Rusty is the Arizona Speaker of the House, representing Arizona State Representative District 25 since January 5th, 2015. Before that, he was a member of the Arizona Senate from 1997 to 2001. And before that, the Arizona House of Representatives from 1993 to 1997. Please join me in welcoming Arizona Speaker of the House, Rusty Bowers. I'd like to thank Becky for those words. Uh, and I'd also like to thank her for her uh, very professional approach to her legislating and I've had the pleasure of knowing Becky and her father and the family for many years and uh, they put their time 
where their mouth is. And I'd like to talk about time. There's a saying that a creature can't learn that which its heart has no shape to hold. Uh, Cormac McCarthy, a favorite author. Um, And it has been a personal evolution for me to learn about mental health. Uh, My family is afflicted with depression, generationally, but also equally balanced with a drive to overcome. Those two at times are a conflict, but can be exacerbated one way or the other by circumstances. Um, I have two heroes. Actually, they're heroines. And if they ever heard I was saying this, I better not go home. And they are two of my daughters. My oldest daughter was an all-state athlete. Um, Took third place in the nation in the Jesse Owens Invitational at the in the 400 meters, she was a wonderful athlete, but was always afraid. And we always wondered, why was it, what was she always so afraid of? And that her fears at times overcame her. Uh, she went and got her master's degree in, in uh, sociology and is a counselor and worked at First Things First. Uh, she has a boy who is... Um, super hyper ADHD, but brilliant. And um, she knows that he and we all know that this family must care for this child. If you said to him, what do you like to read? He says, Hardy Boys. How many Hardy Boys books are there? 63. What's number 32? The mystery of them. That quick. He's... How many volcanoes are there in Italy? Five. Name them. Boom, 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 boom. It's that kind of thing. But he, he is a case study um, in, in a brilliance offset by urges and dispositions to destruction. And so we learn as a family, and thankfully to God, She has a family. The other daughter was the designated driver for friends that went to a party. And she was given a date rape drug. And abused. When they called me and said, your daughter was found on the corner of X and Y in Scottsdale on her way to work. And we didn't understand what was going on. And, and she attempted to self-medicate, as you have mentioned, and others, and was in a horrible spiral, which we didn't even, weren't aware of until I was on a legislative tour and got a call from the police and they said, we're at your home, we want permission to go in. We're doing a wellness check for your daughter. And I said, she's supposed to be at school. She's a substitute teacher. I said, no, she didn't show up. So a neighbor and them got the key, went in and found her comatose. Liver failure and pancreatic failure. And We have been constructing, thankfully, as a family, an environment where she can be safe. And in those years since, she has found a strength that I do not possess, has moved through fighting through this alcoholism to get her master's degree at Grand Canyon, to get her counseling degree and certificate. And now she is a partner owner in a a rehab center and is extremely successful. 
always knowing her battle. Every day is a battle. So this, these different effects of mental illness are personal to me. So now when I'm given opportunity to go down to one North Roosevelt, or was it third, and work in that little center for the uh, mentally needful, many, like my daughter from substance abuse, I'm not their judge. But to work in art, which I love, with them, I find satisfying and it opens up opportunities of discussion with them and ways to help. And now Dave Cass has his show, show in our lobby at the legislature. A brilliant artist. Now, why is this important, Ronnie, as you stand there very patiently? Because, because it's personal. The front line, it's personal. You face it every day in some manifestation. And as we hear these people talking, these things are personal to people. People like me. And I feel no stigma that my family carries this. We carry it. We will. We have faith. We work together. And as communities, we must work with those who don't have what my daughters have. And I thank you so much for letting me be here to learn. Thank you, Ronnie, for this opportunity. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you for sharing your, your personal story as well. So we see how important it is. Our next, guest speak, our next special guest speaker is the Maricopa County Supervisor District 3, Bill Gates. Bill served on the Phoenix City Council representing District 3 from June 2009 through May 2016, 2016. Supervisor Gates has represented District 3 on the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors since 2017 and was elected chairman of the body by his colleagues in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Supervisor Bill Gates. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm truly humbled to be here today. Uh, thank you, Aaron and AP, for bringing this group together. Ron, I think you mentioned Aaron's book. I've bought it. I've just, I haven't read it yet, but I'm ready. I'm ready to get started on it. And, Looking forward to uh, getting the wisdom there. You know, it's very chic to criticize our elected officials. I wish everyone, you said there could have been up to 5.4 4 million people watching this today, could have seen this example of bipartisanship in the Arizona legislature, and especially, Mr. Speaker, that personal story you just shared with us. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. It's so inspiring to all of us because we've all dealt with this in our families. I have as well. And HB, you are an absolute treasure. I've, I've been to three of these now and I've heard your words and I will never forget them. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And, and I wanna make sure to thank the American Legion because if it wasn't for the American Legion, I wouldn't be standing here. As a high school student here in Arizona, I participated in the oratorical contest Got a little bit of money for college. And then I also attended Boys State, American Legion Boys State, where I was the, believe it or not, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and then I did have the opportunity to attend Boys Nation as a senator from Arizona. So thank you to the American Legion for all that they do. I think Aaron and the other speakers have done a great job of setting the scene. The statistics and the impact that mental illness has on our community. But specifically in Maricopa County, it has a very large impact on us. Many of the people, and we'll hear a lot more about this here in a little bit, many of the people who go through our criminal justice system are battling mental illness. Many of the homeless in our community are battling mental illness. And I hope that from the people up here, you can see that at Maricopa County, we understand that and we're taking action, we're working with our partners at the legislature to take action. I was thrilled when the presiding judge, Joe Welty, reached out to me and asked me to co-chair a task force on mental illness in Maricopa County. But it wasn't just him, it's been the whole county. County Attorney Alistair Adele 
has been intimately involved in this, along with her staff, as well as Chief Roska and others from the Sheriff's Office to come together. And what we have done in this task force is dissect the interaction of those with mental illness with our criminal justice system. We've looked at that and evaluated it. And as an attorney, I can tell you that the criminal justice system, our judicial system, is complex. Just imagine layering mental illness on top of that. And when we dissected this and we looked at it, we found what others have found. That those who have mental illness uh, go in and out of the criminal justice system. We found that. We found that they do not properly avail themselves of the justice system. So where are we left at? Well, the encouraging thing was the recommendations that came out of this. And these recommendations gave me hope that we can begin to chip away at these challenges. The first thing has already put, been put into effect. Now, all the people who have appearances in court, they're receiving text messages to remind them of the court dates that they have. And it's not just going to them. It's going to their attorneys. It's going to their family members, friends, people that can help them to get into court. Because if they come into court, it may be tough, but it's going to be a lot better than not appearing in court. Because we know when you don't appear in court, then there are more penalties. And it's a vicious cycle. Another one of the recommendations that came out of this task force is to appoint a court liaison. And this court liaison would be able to go out get the behavioral health information on this defendant, get their guardianship status, and be able to provide that to the judge right in the beginning at that initial appearance to try and divert those people who should be diverted out of that criminal justice system more towards getting that behavioral uh, you know, assistance that they need to help them with their behavioral health issues. And another thing that came out of this, and I'm particularly excited about this, is that um, Judge Welty is sitting down, will be sitting down with other judges, with support staff, to come up with an integrated mental health court system to bring this all together. Now, in Judge Welty's defense, some of this has been put on hold or delayed a little bit by COVID-19, but I can tell you that there's a commitment and I'll tell you this, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, we have told Judge Welty, and he knows that he has our full support to do what he needs to do to make our court system more just for those who are dealing with mental illness. Because if we are truly our brother's keeper, then there is nothing more important than dealing with this issue. Thanks so much. Thank you, Supervisor Gates. We could not, we would not be here today without your support and helping us pull all of this together today. Uh, next spe special guest speaker is former State Senator Leah Landrum Taylor, Assistant Director, Arizona Department of Economic Security. Leah Landrum Taylor was in the Arizona leg Legislature for 16 years, first in the House of Representatives from 1999 through 2007. Then in the Senate from 2007 to 2015, she represented the 23rd, the 16th, and 27th district as the lines were redrawn at the beginning of each decade. Landrum Taylor was the Senate Minority Leader from January to October 2013. During her final term, Landrum Taylor was the only African American in the legislature. Please join me in welcoming the Assistant Director of the Arizona Department of Economic Security and always Senator to me, Senator Leo Landrum Taylor. Thank you so much, Ron. And also thank you to the American Legion Post 65, very special place to me. Actually, one of my first celebrations that right after I won was right in this room, so very special. Thank you to um, AP for the invitation here this morning. And as I stand here as the wife and also the daughter of, a, of veterans, and looking back as I grew up with my uncle, 
who grew up in my home, and he suffered from an SMI. And I will say from there, it's, it's interesting to see all the different dynamics that we had to go through throughout our life and working with my uncle at the time. When I was growing up, I never knew when he came out of the door which personality he was going to be. So as a child, it was quite fascinating to me. One day he was someone, next day he was someone else, and we just rolled along with it. And we accepted the fact that this, is what our, this, is, this was Uncle Chris and made sure to get the types of services that he needed. What would happen is when he would leave out of the home and then people would not feel the same way, the same type of endearment that we had for him and the acceptance that we had for him and the times that we would have to come and rescue him or go find him, which is why I'm glad that there are so many different linkages and partnerships that are going on between law enforcement and mental health services because it's very important that that happens. I will say that on a good note, when my uncle left this earth, he left it independent in his own place, living in his own apartment. That was amazing. It was because of the various services that were there for him. As Senator Rios mentioned earlier, the importance of those wraparound services, well, it was there. And we never could imagine that he would be in his own house doing his own thing. And that was absolutely incredible. Not being afraid anymore to take the medications, something really important. And I think about what's going on right now as we look at the pandemic and knowing that there are so many things that can just escalate individuals who are already suffering from mental illnesses or depression, whatever it may be. And that's why I was really glad that when this whole pandemic took place, our department, we took a serious look at what we could do in order to help those so that they wouldn't have to worry about certain things like, what am I gonna do with my children to make sure if they qualified for free and reduced lunch, that they would still be able to get food for their children. So knowing that we were able to issue $190 million out for those families to offer that relief and to take off that burden off their plate. Those who, the families who had family members who had developmentally disabil disabilities, we wanted to make sure that we offered things that would not exasperate and further complicate things that were going on. So families were then able to be paid to be those caregivers. We were still able to offer through telemedicine to make sure that they were receiving those important critical services so that they wouldn't get any further off track because of the pandemic. These were the things that we, that we looked at that were very important to us in going forward. Also the fact of childcare, and we know that that's a major thing when you're out here and you're just trying to make it from day to day. So with the pandemic relief that came for childcare services, $18 million that was issued to over 1,800 childcare providers. Now some may say, well, okay, but actually that's a really big deal to know that your child can be safe and sound. When, when things are going in this direction. These are the things that the governor talked about back in August, and that was just a portion that was distributed. More to come from there. But I will say, we look around and we, we keep hearing about the fact that so many of the children that may be home and the families, and they're, they're isolated away from their, their social groups. And so those that have moved and taken great strides in this area of mental health, truly they deserve some applause. And what's going on and what's happening with the children not being able to connect is making a big difference with them socially. So we know we'll have to be there, be there in every single way that we can and come up with innovative ways so that they can interact, the young people and what they can do. The amount of depression that they're suffering from it's high and we can't ignore that because they're not around their social environment. 
AP mentioned this morning with Omar, who's, who's here with us today, and very glad that you're here, Omar. And to have that perspective of those, the millennials, and what they're struggling with and what they're going through, whether it's trying to find jobs or whatever it may be, employment, we have to be here for them. So for each, I challenge you to, if, you, if you're not doing it already, make sure that you really truly are mentoring some of the young people that are out here, helping them to navigate that where they may not have the type of family support like from my family or as, 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 as uh, Representative Bowers stated earlier, Speaker Bowers, or from his family, they may not have that kind of support. So they are needing those, and those especially if, you, if you're in that profession, help to mentor these young people so that they can learn to navigate through the waters and not feel like a shark may eat them up. So I thank you all for this opportunity to be able to just share a little bit, a little bit from a personal life and a whole lot of knowing the fact that within our Department of Economic Security, we are doing every single thing we can in order to help provide a safety net for those so that they do not slip through the cracks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Landrum Taylor, Assistant Director, Arizona DES. Now to our panel. Panelists, I will introduce you to our audience before we bring up our moderator. Just please wave your hand for the audience as well as for the production crew as I introduce you. First, we have Alistair Adele, Maricopa County Attorney. Please welcome Alistair Adele. <laughs> Barry Roska, Chief of Custody and Detention, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Please welcome Barry Roska. <laughs> judge Joseph Welty, Presiding Judge, Maricopa County Superior Court. Please welcome Judge Joseph Welty. Kelly Donnelly Williams, State Suicide Prevention Specialist for Arizona Health Care Cost Containment System. <laughs> Debbie Dominic, Chief Social Worker, Phoenix VA Medical Center. Please welcome Debbie. And Nikki Kuntz, Clinical Director, Teen Lifeline. Please welcome Nikki. Thank you all again for being here. Now we introduce our moderator, the esteemed W. Scott Bales. He's a retired Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. He was appointed to the court in 20, 2005 by Governor Janet Napolitano. He was retained for a six-year term in 2008. He was then elected by his fellow justices as Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court effective June 27, 2014. He received his bachelor's degree from Michigan State University, went on to earn his master's degree from Harvard. University, as well as his Juris Doctorate for Magna Cum Laude from Harvard Law School. While at Harvard, he was a member of the Board of Editors of the Harvard Law Review. Following law school, Judge Bell's clerk for the Office of the Solicitor General, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and the United States Supreme Court. This is just a small piece of his extensive bio, uh, which include private practice and some other things. Chief Justice Bales retired from the Arizona Supreme Court on July 31, 2019. As you can see from his appearance here today, he continues to serve and give back to his community. Let's please give your honor the appropriate and respect as we welcome Chief Justice Scott Bales. Ron, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you and Aaron Bear and AP Powell for putting this event together, and I thank all the panelists and the speakers for their remarks. And I also want to thank Post 65 for hosting us. Um, I have the greatest respect for those who served in our military. Um, Seventy years ago this month, my father enlisted in the Marines, and um, the wounds he suffered in Korea the following spring, he carried with him all of his life in, until he died last March. And he struggled for years with the related mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, the powerful poem that H.B. Branch read, the remarks of Senator Bowers, the remarks of Assistant Director Landrum, uh, 
Taylor. <laughs> I was trying to make sure I didn't forget the Landrum. Um, they, they powerfully illustrate that we all know people who've struggled with mental health issues. And many of us, whether we recognize it or not, know people who have considered or attempted suicide. The, uh, in the United States, before the pandemic, an estimated one out of five Americans suffered some form of mental health issues, ranging from depression to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder to more severe forms of mental illness. In Arizona, that translates into nearly 925,000 adults struggling with some form of mental health condition. Sadly, though, only four out of 10 of those individuals receive any kind of treatment. And four is a number that stuck in my mind because as we were sitting here today through the program to this point, approximately four Americans across the country took their own lives. In the United States, annually about 48,000 people commit suicide. It's the 10th leading cause of death. And it's actually increased approximately 31% over the last several years. In Arizona, on average, four people today will take their own lives. And that'll occur again tomorrow and the day after. In Arizona, suicide's the eighth leading cause of death. And for people aged 10 through 34, it's the second leading cause of death. We face, as Patrick Kennedy said in a moving memoir, a common struggle. It's a common struggle that, unfortunately, we don't often enough openly recognize and address. And that's why I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to help moderate the discussion with today's panel. And I'm going to begin with a remark recently made by Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the Center for Disease Control. Dr. Redfield said, stigma is the enemy of public health. So I'd like to begin first with a question to Debbie Dominic. Or, I'm sorry, I got ahead in my notes. Uh, the question would be first to um, Kelly Williams, and then I'll go down that side of the room. So, Ms. Williams, um, what are some ways to reach out to those people who are experiencing mental health issues to help them overcome um, whatever sense of shame they may have in seeking help and support? So when we talk about suicide prevention in our work, uh, which of course is part of your question related to mental illness, we talk about how it, it cannot be done by one state agency or by one community forum. It is the responsibility of everybody in the community to um, be a good neighbor, to reach out to those who live on your street, who live alone, recognizing that uh, individuals in Arizona who are 65 and older are our greatest at risk for suicide even more so if you've ever served in the military or if you live in rural Arizona. If you have someone in your life, whether it's uh, a child whose parents are going through a divorce or an older adult who's just lost his or her spouse, recognizing that those sorts of losses can cause, uh, can cause depression and can cause someone to start thinking about suicide. And so what we, what we really focus on is encouraging individuals to reach out to others, to neighbor, to make a point of asking people how they're doing, and um, to try to walk alongside individuals who may be going through a difficult time. We were very fortunate uh, several months ago at Access to receive a FEMA grant to create resilientarizona.org, which is a free resource for anybody in Arizona who needs crisis counseling services. Uh, if you call 211 or you go to resilientarizona.org, regardless of you, if you have insurance, if you're on access or another plan or you don't have health insurance, they can provide counseling, counseling services for free and can help guide you through the next steps. So what we are really interested in communicating to the community at large, especially during the pandemic, is that we all have mental health. Some days we have good mental health, some days we may have poor mental health. If you recognize someone in your life or you yourself is dealing with um, mental, mental concerns, you don't feel like yourself or you're recognizing those symptoms in someone else, 
to please try to connect them to Resilient Arizona or another resource in the community now before it becomes a crisis. And the number you mentioned again, that 211 number, is that like a 911 number? Or? 211 is a, uh, a community resource phone number. It, it goes to our local crisis system and it is answered by our crisis system. And from there, the phone call can be directed to other social services as needed. So what we, again, uh, a, a great point is that if you have someone in your life who you're worried about or you yourself are worried, we have the most robust crisis system in the nation. You can call our crisis line at any time, 211 or the Maricopa County crisis line, or there, there are different crisis lines uh, for, for different regions in Arizona. That crisis system is completely paid for by our tax dollars. They will assess your situation. They will possibly send a mobile unit to you at no expense to you to help assess what's going on with, with the individual in need. And then determine, well, what, what, what do we need to do with this person? If the person is actively suicidal, he or she could be transferred to an emergency room, et cetera. You get the idea. So it's, uh, it is a great local resource for our state. It's something that we as Arizonans should be very proud of to have that available to us and to be a part of, to have this crisis system available to us. And we really want to encourage individuals to access those services as necessary. Yeah. Ms. Dominic, um, Ms. Williams mentioned that veterans have a higher rate of suicide than the general population. I, I believe it's some multiple. And I, I'm curious, um, in your work, how you reach out to those individuals? How do you convince people that illness is not a weakness? That is an excellent question. Thank you very much for asking that. So in working with the military population, you're working with people who help. They are the first responders. They are the people that put their lives on the line every day. So asking for help is not a go-to. It's not a normal situation. It's something that they provide, not something that they ask for. So letting people understand that we are here to help and as Kelly talked about, it takes a village, right? So if my neighbor I'm noticing is a Marine and hasn't been out in a while or his flag has been taken down, his Marine flag that he flies so proudly is no longer up there, I'm gonna knock on that door and say, hey, John, what's, what's going on? Uh, how are you feeling? How are things going? Um, just kind of having that conversation. We always want people to understand that the VA, there is no wrong door. We are available 24-7, 365. Um, we have opportunities with our community partners. Um, if even veterans who may have received a uh, discharge that was dishonorable or other than honorable will provide mental health care for one year. Um, so letting people know all of the resources that are available. One of the things that I would love to see, I hope in my lifetime, is an opportunity as people are discharging from the military to matriculate right into the VA system so that we always know who you are. Because what we find is oftentimes somebody will say, um, I already enrolled in the VA. Well, actually what you've done is you've applied maybe for a service connection or that you've applied for voc rehab benefits or VA loan, but we've never touched the healthcare system. So to circle back to your question, what we're finding oftentimes is our veterans that are choosing um, to die by suicide is that we wanna change that, that, that choice. We wanna let people know we are here to help you. Um, and we're also finding that those veterans oftentimes haven't touched the VA system healthcare either ever or within the past two years specifically. So what we want people to understand is please enroll in your benefits. Um, I, I wanna share an example of this. I have a, a friend who is 68, a uh, Vietnam era veteran, never enrolled in this healthcare at the VA. He's a healthcare provider in the community. No, 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 that's somebody who might need it more than I do. I can't take that benefit from one of my brothers or one of my sisters, I cannot do that. So it was a lot of explanation about that's not how the system works. Um, and the day that he finally got his card in the mail, because we did get to the point where he, he registered, um, I, get a, I got a text with his, his picture of his VA card and thank you. I got a call from him the other day and he said, I discharged 46 years ago today from the United States Army. So it's always a part of us. So please um, know that we are here to serve. And if, if a veteran or a family member or friend did want to reach out, where would they go? What that is an excellent question as well. So uh, not unlike what Kelly was talking about, the robust opportunities we have in Maricopa County, we can do that as well. In VA in particular, we're moving toward having a three-digit phone number for people to call for a suicide crisis line, a prevention crisis line as well. But currently we ask uh, that people call the crisis line at 1-800-273-8255. Veterans then press one. Um, it's, there, it's staffed every day, 24 hours a day. You can text, you can call. There are so many modalities. 
and our police partners that I see in the room, invaluable to us. I cannot tell you how often we're calling about wellness checks and you never know what you're walking into, yeah. ever. Yeah. So I'm so grateful to you, the lives that you saved. Um, I don't even know if you're aware of that, uh, you know, what that number looks like on any given day, but um, that opportunity and that partnership, uh, and I can let you know, you know, I'm on the phone with John, he's telling me he has a weapon in his hand so that you understand what you're walking into as well. He's a veteran. Um, how do we move forward with, with getting this person the care that they need? So oftentimes, what we want to do is prevent people from getting to that crisis part, right? So we want to, we talk, uh, we work with Be Connected, we talk about being upstream, taking care of things. So especially during the pandemic, you know, we're looking at how do we help people, uh, social determinants of health, how do we make sure they have enough food? How do we make sure that they can uh, pay their rent or their mortgage? Yeah. And the CARES Act has offered many opportunities, but we, have, we get concerned about what happens when that uh, opportunity ends when those money stop. So we are very fortunate in the state of Arizona where we have agencies that are able to provide uh, monetary assistance. And and turning to Ms. Kuntz, how do you, how do you reach out to young people who may be struggling with mental health issues and encourage them to be open and to seek help. And I imagine that might even be more of a problem today in a world of social media where teens and other youth are understandably very conscious of, of right. the image that they project. Um, yes and no to the last part of that question. I'll tell you that um, stigma is kind of twofold when you're talking about teenagers. You're talking about the stigma of them reaching out for help and looking different um, you know, looking broken, um, broken at an early age, or they've been told you're so smart, you're so strong, you do all these great things, and they think that um, having a mental health challenge or having um, those feelings of helplessness at times um, is a is a deficit to their personality and a deficit to their character. And I think that's a struggle that m most people have that are struggling with mental health challenges or, or thoughts of suicide. But the additional stigma you have is with their family and whether or not their family, how they feel about mental health, how they feel about reaching out for help and their knowledge of the system. And oftentimes kids feelings and children's mental health gets pushed to the side thinking it's adolescent development it's a moody teenager not really understanding the importance of um, still getting their mental health support taken care of so a lot of when it comes to destigmatization of mental health of with children it's it starts with the parents it starts with the community um, like Kelly and Debbie said, it, it does take a village. It takes every one of us reaching out to our loved ones or people that we know. You never know what will save a life. And especially when we're talking about teenagers, many of them don't necessarily need um, treatment per se, but sometimes they just need access to support. And you never know which one of you may be that person. You know, when it comes to Teen Lifeline, we spend a lot of time doing education with parents within the school, and we are a crisis service, so we spend a lot of time making sure that not only are we providing the education, but the wraparound service of having a crisis number for the moment of that crisis. The other thing that makes us a little different as a crisis service is we're talking about a crisis of a teenager or a pre-adolescent, which if any of you have children of that age, <laughs> that could be just about anything, <laughs> which we recognize if we take that serious then, the ability to create resilience, to create um, problem-solving skills later on may create a situation where they never have thoughts of suicide, that upstream kind of prevention. But the crisis line is also there. We. Um, we're actually the agency that really pushed the ID initiative, which um, a bill was passed this year uh, that actually supports that in the coming years. Um, but we're, our phone number is on the back of over 200,000, 250,000 children's IDs in the state, their school IDs. And that's over 240 schools across the state have our phone number so that families and the families are giving messages as well and families know that they can call us but it really is going back to that it takes a village 
We all have to reach out. You don't know if you, if it's your child's uh, best friend who might need you to turn to them and say, you look a little, you, you look a little down today, or I've noticed that you haven't been around a lot lately. What's going on? I mean, you never know when you're going to be the person who saves the day. And I can tell you, as far as social media, we just got a call last week from a child who said, I was having thoughts of suicide, but I saw a social media post that you had made, and you shared a comment I made on your social media, and that made me want to reach out for help. Mm. So social media really can save lives if it's done the right way, and it's just about remembering our children are watching us, our children are watching how we adults are, are behaving, and we need to make notice of that. And also, I would love to also thank the law enforcement in the room. You do not know what you do for us on the crisis line and the lives you help us save. And if it wasn't for you guys, there'd be many more lives lost. Well, you mentioned legislation. I believe you're referring to the Mitch Warnick Act, which the legislature passed with bipartisan mm -hmm. support this past year and, and mandates uh, training on suicide awareness and prevention for all school employees, from bus drivers to teachers to administrators. Um, and you also mentioned social media, which, which brings me to a question I'll ask again uh, each of the three of you. Beyond the resources you've mentioned, um, if you were trying to help invoke the community in, in helping to recognize or address these issues. Are there other um, websites or materials that you'd like to identify to call attention to? Ms. Ms. Williams? Sure. We strongly recommend as community members that everybody be trained in a suicide prevention training. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most state agencies have trainers on hand. We have partners both at Access and at the Department of Education and other state agencies that can organize those trainings for you free of, free of cost. We also recognize the individual's responsibility in suicide prevention. And so September is Suicide Prevention Month. I've given this talk probably 20 times this month, which is great. I sound a little bit like a broken record, but what I encourage at the end of our community presentations is that I'm giving each of you homework. And your homework is to put the Maricopa County crisis line number in your cell phone. So when you need it, you don't have to look it up. And to identify five people in your life who you've not spoken to recently. They don't have to be actively suicidal. They don't have to have a substance use issue or a mental illness. But try to think of five people that you have not connected with recently. And if they're individuals who have gone through a loss or they're individuals who live alone, you get bonus points. Because what it takes is a human connection to um, encourage people to want to fight on for another day. So in addition to resilientarizona.org and the Access website has tons of suicide prevention resources, I would encourage you all if you haven't taken a safe talk or an assist training or a mental health first aid training to really seek that out because it really, it does, the responsibility does lie with each of us to be more aware of what the symptoms look like and also how to direct individuals into care who may be in need. I can get the number. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I want to piggyback on exactly what Kelly's talking about. Those resources are outstanding. And for those of you who um, are, are working in a, another healthcare system other than the VA, um, making sure that those providers understand military culture because our veterans are seen in the community and there's a, a disconnect in what it's like to work with a veteran if you're not uh, familiar with the culture. So uh, making sure that that is respected and understood and what the experience may have been during deployment uh, and any kind of active duty opportunity. So, and what is it also like to be a family member of um, a veteran or somebody who is currently active duty? So asking those questions, making sure that even if you're responding to a call, and it could be a domestic violence call, it could be any, you never know. Um, the, the calls that I receive aren't on, unlike the calls that you receive, only you're going to the house. Um, but what else is happening? What else is happening in that, in that home? One of the things I, I would like to mention in particular with all of our uh, legal partners in the room is the appreciation with the Veterans Justice Program and our veterans who have their own court system. Um, and they're able to enter into that system. So all the things that we touched on earlier today or this morning uh, about um, uh, mental health issues and the stigma and substance misuse, um, 
if we're looking at a very specific population, veterans are the only ones that have this opportunity in this court. It's incredible. Um, and looking at what else brought them here. HB, you have a, a perfect example of what we're talking about. You, um, you when you were speaking, uh, my whole body responded to that. I had a, I worked with a young Marine who talked about um, um, fear being his, his only friend, sitting on the front of his porch. And then this young man, an outstanding Marine, uh, but brought all of that childhood uh, trauma into that combat relationship. So what does that look like as we're peeling that onion? How do we make sure that we're providing the very, very best care and not, not missing any of that? So our community providers paying attention to that, asking the next question, asking questions that don't end with yes or no. Uh, and Kelly talked about reaching out to somebody you haven't spoken to in a while. Um, is your car running is not the question to start with. Um, you know, what did you eat for dinner last night? How are things going at home? You know, whatever. Did the plant that I dropped off, you know, three months ago, is it flowering? It can, it can start anywhere. It's amazing. You meet people on the airplane standing next to you. You just never know when you're going to have an opportunity. What I would ask is that people not be afraid to ask the question. Um, in, in terms of resources, um, you know, it's, uh, so Teen Lifeline, we, we actually partner with the County Crisis Line to provide the wraparound services, but between the hours of 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. every day, our hotline is actually answered by teenagers mm -hmm. that are trained and have uh, master's level clinicians next to them. But with the understanding of any of you that have one been a teenager or have a teenager, you all know that they, turn to t they seem to turn to their friends and their peers first. And we see that even with social media. They look at their peers on social media to compare their lives. And so that's the basis of Teen Lifeline, is that they can call and talk to someone who understands what it's like to be a teenager and um, get a listening ear, support, and potentially a referral and, and help um, along the way. Um, it's also a place where parents um, and other concerned citizens can call. Um, we also have texting available, but we are a resource for anyone who's worried about a child. Um, and we do understand that the current mental health system, there are not enough mental health providers. There are not. Um, I, would, I, I am constantly training new social workers, but it's not enough. <laughs> and um, so it's helping families to know that there are resources to help them to get through that next month before their first provider, um, before they have that first counseling session or that first intake appointment that they can utilize the services, the crisis services and things like that to be that medium point to help support them. Um, our, there's plenty of resources for families on our website as well at teenlifeline.org and our um, hotline number is 602-248-8336. Uh, um, we, again, we are available, but also our social media is a great place to learn. And we are also, along with many other providers that are part of the Arizona Suicide Prevention Coalition, um, also provide many of the trainings that Kelly was talking about so that those trainings are available statewide by many people for free to the community at large. It's just about reaching out and saying, hey. And to piggyback on that, having that open dialogue, I would be remiss to say, if I did not say that, if you are worried about someone and you think that they might be having thoughts of suicide or they might be having thoughts of giving up in some capacity, please ask that most difficult question, which is, are you having thoughts of suicide? And make sure that they know that if that is where they're at, that you are gonna be there with them to find that next step and to know that you can call any of the numbers that we've given, and we will all direct you back to the right one. If it's not, <laughs> we, will all, we all work together to make that happen. But please don't be afraid to ask that most important life-saving question, or are you having thoughts of suicide? Ms. Coons, thank you. I, and Ms. Williams, do you have the number? I, yes, I do. Um, and I also wanted to mention, and I can't believe this didn't come immediately to mind, but for those who are not familiar with Be Connected, Be Connected is a statewide campaign that's um, a partnership between the Department of Veterans Services, the Arizona Coalition for Military Families, and other organizations, including many of us here on this panel, to provide suicide prevention and other behavioral health resources to individuals who've served in the military and their families, they, including navigators. 
so, which means is a person who is trained to go to someone's home who's identified to, to be having an issue, who's either served in the military or is a family member of somebody who's served in the military. They can solve all kinds of social problems. It doesn't have to be somebody who's just actively suicidal. It could be somebody who needs help getting connected to their local food bank, as an example. All kinds of different social issues. And we've really worked very hard to um, get the message out about Be Connected. It is BeConnectedArizona.org. It's another great resource. Um, you can also reach Be Connected by calling 211. All of those phone numbers come in the same place. The Maricopa County Crisis Line phone number. You can call 211, which is easy to remember, or it's 602 222 9444. I should have that memorized by now, but I'm always afraid I'm going to give the wrong number. So. All right. Thank you. Well, Ms. Dominic. Um, mm -hmm reference to the veterans courts and I think it's, that's a good transition to talking about the intersection more broadly between mental health and the justice system something that Supervisor Gates talked about in his opening remarks so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the other panelists to talk a little bit about their perspective on how um, their respective agencies or institutions interact with people experiencing mental illness and I'll, I'll begin with Chief Roska yeah, thank you. I, I think it's very important what was mentioned earlier. Um, in 30 years that I've been working as a law enforcement officer, one of the main resources we always have whenever we arrive at a house are the neighbors. Um, we have databases. We put information in about times that we may have been there before. But when we find a community member that's in distress, we're trying to find an answer other than a simple enforcement of a violation of the law. Um, we look to those uh, community members, those neighbors that are living next door to say, give us information, tell us, help us to understand better the individual that we're having contact with in, inside the home. That way it allows us to put context behind the actions that are being taken and then possibly find a resolution to something, an alternative to simply incarceration. Now within our own agency of the Sheriff's Office, we're very fortunate and I thanks to Mercy Maricopa as we have critical incident response uh, training that does go on. We have 85 deputy sheriffs that are throughout our patrol area so that they're being brought up to speed on those first moments of contact with a community member that's in distress about making those assessments. We're beginning in our training academy um, to incorporate, you know, de-escalation, all of the CIT components so that upon arrival um, we are looking at something other than just the black and white of the written law and the actions that are taken. We've become much more, trying to become much more a responsive uh, resource for our community members as we enforce or we try to look to expand our training, give our deputy sheriffs, our law enforcement officers a, a, a wider latitude of decision making and realizing too that the response that they're taking, the efforts that they're making are very much meant so that if we can find a resolution now, we won't have to return later. You know, and so that is, that's the, the primary focus as we restructure our, our, basically the thinking of our training academies so that it's more than just, there, there's certainly, it's over, it's over 27 weeks to come through a, an academy to be certified as a law enforcement officer. And then after that, it's followed up with about six months of field training. It takes a very long time to be fully implemented as an independent resource for our community. But I think that what we're beginning to do is to understand the dynamics better of what it is that our community needs us to be providing for them. And how can we partner with our, our agencies across the state, our courts and our prosecutors, our public defenders, and our community leaders to say, what is it more that we can do? And I think that's one of the progressive things that we've been able to tackle from a law enforcement perspective is to be open to discussion, then review, and then begin to change, begin to do things. So as I mentioned, our training has increased, our critical incident response teams are up and running, and that we're always looking for added uh, resources, um, whether it is through training or through community partnerships, so that when we are called to duty, um, we provide the greatest level of service that we can. Alistair Adell, as, as county attorney, the prosecuting agency for Maricopa County, uh, what, what's your perspective on these issues? Well, Chief Justice, you're always Chief Justice to me. I don't know if this mic's on, maybe we'll look over here. Um, I, I just want to thank everybody for being here today, and the remarks that have already been made um, were very impactful for me. Um, this is something that strikes home for me, and Senator Rios, you talked about 
children. I have two school-age boys. One of them has oppositional defiant disorder. One of them has ADHD. And so I understand. Um, and again, like our panel members have said, we are all in this together. Um, to our law enforcement partners, I was uh, fortunate to serve as the chair of the board for the Hunter Club of Arizona, where we did focus on mental health for our first responders. Um, so definitely take a look at that as a resource. So what we're doing in our office, um, I want to thank Judge Wealthy down there, um, who I've known for a long time, but he reached out early on when I took office, which is now almost a year ago. Um, and we talked about mental health. We talked about how the prosecution office can collaborate. I talked with the Board of Supervisors about these issues. How can we do better and be better? I'm proud to say that we have a very robust um, diversion program. And there's one that specifically focuses on seriously mentally ill people mm -hmm. so that they can get the therapy that they need. Because as we know, many people are committing crimes out there because they have drug addiction, underlying mental health condition. And if we can get them an evidence-based program through diversion and get them the help they need, connect them with services in our community, eliminate that barrier to housing, um, look at sensible expungement reforms in the legislature, things like this. Um, we want people to be succeeding. We want people to be back and working with little disruption to their families, to their schooling, to work. And it is incumbent upon us as prosecutors to make sure that we are committed to programs such as this because eliminating those barriers and then realizing the problems early on is something that is, is very important to me and my administration. So just, just to clarify for um, those of us who are not perhaps Sorry. steeped in the justice system, when you talk about diversion, what is the person avoiding hmm. by the programs you described? What, what is it a diversion from? Well, and I apologize. I should have said that from the outset. Um, so diversion is when you have um, low-level offenders. Um, again, those that want to do better and be better in our system. Those that have a low risk of recidivism, because that's what we're aiming for, reduce recidivism. Say like public intoxication, someone obstreperously disturbing the peace, that kind of thing? Uh, even higher felonies than that. Um, we have people that, you know, I'm going to give you an example. There's a woman I know, and her daughter was in a car crash when she was in college. And she got addicted to pain pills. And it escalated to heroin. And she tried to pawn a ring to get money for drugs. And she spiraled mentally. She was convicted of um, trafficking stolen property, which under this program, we would offer diversion to that person to get them the help that they need. The problem was her mental health spiraled out of control and she was on probation, living with her drug dealer boyfriend and the probation office came and knocked on the door. They came in and there was weapons all over the house. So they charged her with misconduct involving weapons because mm -hmm. as on probation, you shouldn't be near any weapons. Well, she went to prison for three and a half years. And these are the people that need the help to do better and be better. So if you're in a diversion program, you will get assessed from SAGE counseling on your likelihood to reoffend, to relapse, your criminogenic needs, antisocial behavior. And it is way faster than traditional prosecution, which as you know, it takes 18 months to two years, taking time off of work to go to court. And this program allows people to successfully complete the program, get the things that they need in four to six months, and then their charges are dismissed. So that barrier to housing that I spoke about, everything else is gone. But they have to want to do the program, and I'm proud to say um, during my tenure that the pandemic, which has affected all of us, personally and professionally. Um, we had to roll out the program a little bit later, but since May, we've now offered it to 3,000 people. And we're gonna continue to look at increasing those numbers so that we can reduce recidivism in our community, reduce people who are having contact with law enforcement, because it's the right thing to do. Well, presiding Judge Welty, um, I don't know if this was clear from the introduction, but the Maricopa County Superior Court is one of the largest courts in the United States, uh, not just because of our county's population and geographic size, 
you mentioned a task force, or uh, I guess uh, Ron mentioned a task force in introducing you. What are, what are some of the things the courts have been doing to um, deal with those in the judicial system that are struggling with mental health issues? Well, really any number of things, but I, I, I want to go a thousand feet up uh, quickly. Um, I was a federal prosecutor for 17 years. I've been a judge for 14 years. I ran the criminal department of Maricopa County for three of those years and was a criminal judge for six of those years. Uh, by statutory creation and court rule, which is what the criminal justice system is made up of, um, it is a system wholly inequipped to address the needs of the mentally ill. Wholly inequipped. It's not designed for it. But as a matter of law, not designed for it. Uh, uh, to uh, this is a pretty educated crowd right in front of me. But for for those online, um, there's no out in the criminal justice system for mental illness and behavioral health. You'll hear uh, about competence, and you'll think people get dropped out of the system because they're not competent. Uh, there is, in fact, a competency determination that takes place. But a competency determination is simply. Uh, do you understand the nature of the proceedings against you, and are you able to help your lawyer? Uh, and, and if you can do both of those things, then you're competent and you stay in the system. Um, there is insanity, and I think members of the public can think if you're truly mentally ill, you won't be criminally responsible because you'll be found insane. Uh, criminal insanity as a matter of Arizona law is failure to understand the wrongfulness of your conduct. And there is almost no mental health condition that results in that. Um, there are not outs written into the criminal justice system for the mentally ill. Now, our justice system does an extraordinary amount for the mentally ill, but not by code and not by rule, but by necessity. Uh, because the criminal justice system has become part of a default system for addressing the needs of the mentally ill in our community. Now, that's not to suggest that this side of the room isn't doing their job. I don't mean that at all. Um, it's a, it, it is a resource question, and it is a motivation. You know, you you, you got to go. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll pluck you out of your house. You got to go, and so you can have resources. If people are not availing themselves of that, then it, episodically they will engage in behavior that is antisocial that violates the law. The police agencies have been doing an extraordinary job in Maricopa County at what we call intercept zero. Uh, on our sequential intercept model. And that is diverting even before a prosecutor gets involved. Uh, uh, rather than arresting and taking to jail, uh, taking somebody to a, 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 a trauma, mental health trauma center. And there's a number of these around the valley. There need to be more. Um, but again, I, I want to go back and pin on what I talked about initially. That's not by law. That's not by court rule. That's why individual police agencies, many of which in the Valley are doing it, some of which are not. Some officers in the Valley in those agencies are doing it, some are not. Um, it's a matter of individual discretion by individual agency and by individual officer. And, and that is absolutely critical that you take somebody who is, who is primarily a behavioral health issue and keep them out of the justice system completely. Um, if you get arrested and you go to jail, uh, our pretrial services, which is arm of our probation office, the probation of the adult and juvenile probation offices are arms of the court and therefore fall within the judicial branch. They are amongst the 3,200 employees of our fourth largest court system uh, in the United States. And they try to do the best they can to do enough history of mental illness for someone prior to them seeing a judge. But keep in mind, in the United States Constitution, you've got to see a judge in 24 hours. Uh, and the self-reporter is the individual going through a mental health crisis. So you're going to get a limited amount of information in the first 24 hours for a judge to make a determination as to whether you are either dangerous or whether you're going to make it to your next court appearance, which is the sole determination being made as to whether you stay in jail or whether you get out. Uh, it is a limited window of time and is a limited amount of information. Uh, we are working together with, with these folks uh, to share data, um, to uh, migrate systems together so that we can make better decisions on the front end about whether somebody stays or goes. We know that if you initially go to jail and you spend over 48 hours in jail, your recidivism rate goes sky high. 
And if you just think about that, I mean, you're off your meds, you're away from your regular care provider, you lose your job, you potentially lose your kids. Uh, once you start to lose those motivating factors, it becomes pretty easy to spin back around. So if you go to jail and you didn't need to because we didn't know enough about you to get you back to your, case, your SMI case manager or, or to get you into a facility for a, a, a general mental illness, uh, then you're in jail. Now, the jail is doing a fantastic job uh, because they have become a mental health institution. And correctional health does very, very well. And we are seeing much better uh, uh, coordination uh, between uh, community providers and jail providers so that there's consistency of prescription medications, uh, there's, there's adequate reentry programs if you're designated SMI to come out of the jail into the waiting arms of your case manager. Um, if, if we can find out as judges as quickly as possible that you have this sort of supported background, that you have consistent case management, then it makes it far more likely that you're going to make it to your next court appearance. Um, and, and so that can prompt release the more data uh, we get. Um, the, the, the programs that Ms. Adele is talking about, the diversion programs, absolutely fabulous programs. But remember, for the policymakers in the room, that is at the discretion of the county attorney. She's doing a terrific job in this area. But that's very personality dependent around the state. That's not law. And that's not rule. That's prosecution discretion. And, and good for her, and we are fully supportive uh, of going in that direction. But that lasts as long as the person in that office lasts. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is all of these things are dependent upon a prosecutor and a defense attorney identifying an issue, bringing that issue forward, and taking into account mental health, whether it's in a plea resolution, uh, whether it's in a, a term and condition of probation, whether somebody goes off to mental health court or, or veterans court. And all of that, because it's a matter of discretion and it's a matter of practice, not a matter of rule or law, that it gets lost. Some of it you're gonna find out about and it's gonna be taken into account. Some of it isn't. The county attorney files somewhere on the order of 2,000 felony cases a month uh, into this justice system. Um, and, and look, I'd love to say that we got to spend a, a day with every individual one of those 2,000 to evaluate what would be the best outcome for them it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And so where, where those diversion cases, that's fabulous. But are they finding the right people? It, it, people talk about slipping through the cracks. It, they're not slipping through the cracks. They're not being pulled out of the system. There are no cracks in the system. They just stay in the system all the way to DOC. Um, uh, it, it's... If you don't have a legal structure for addressing mental illness in the criminal justice system, you are going to get a discretionary structure which does the best it can and doesn't do it for everybody. Well, building on that, I think it'd be interesting to hear the panel's perspective on within your realms. What, what do you see as the, the biggest challenge to better addressing mental health issues. And um, County Attorney Adele, I'll begin with you. Well, thank you, Chief Justice. Um, I really would like to see a program that is pre-adjudication because uh, many of our municipalities have pre-adjudication courts and programs to assist veterans, to assist those with mental health. And I know I've mentioned it to Judge Wealthy before, and some of it's a capacity issue, um, but it's discussions that we've been having and um, my transition team recommended. Um, our, our former state bar president, uh, John Phelps, um, was one of the transition team members, and we, uh, something we discussed. Um, but Judge Wilkins is absolutely correct. There's nothing built into the system at all. In the realm of prosecution, prosecutors are given a police report. They don't necessarily see the assessment done by the initial parents court. So we worked collaboratively with the person's defense attorney to get that information as mitigation um, to successfully resolve a plea because our criminal justice system is made up of thousands and thousands of cases. And what I've instructed our staff to do is that look at every single case because 
Now we are taking a treatment first approach. We are looking at the offender and not just the offense and looking at those underlying conditions. It's gonna take time. Um, obviously the pandemic has put everything into a screeching halt, uh, but we're, we're working collaboratively with our law enforcement and court partners to make sure that we are in line with this because I have told our staff that we are character driven professionals doing the right things for the right reasons every single time. And I am committed to looking at the offender and their underlying issues and not just what they're charged with. Well, and as part of the backdrop, I know that national studies suggest that as many as a quarter of those who are incarcerated have had a recent incident of mental illness. And, and the pitfall, of course, is a, setting up a system where people are just cycling through, never receiving the appropriate treatment, and the underlying conduct that's leading to potentially criminal activity is, is never really addressed. So I think your, your point about identifying pre-adjudication ways to afford treatment uh, seems very responsive to that. Um, Chief Roscoe, what, what, from your perspective, is the, the big challenge or an area where we need to make some improvement? My primary responsibility right now is basically the, uh, the jail system uh, for uh, Sheriff Penzone. As, uh, as Judge Welty had, had mentioned earlier, from a patrol perspective, these, these uh, uh, treatment centers that are available to our patrol officers and our deputies so that when we can correctly identify a community member in distress that the biggest thing is time we're always trying to get something resolved and move on to the next whatever it is that's awaiting us and so these drop-off centers allow us to take our community member and instantly get them in a process into the pipeline of evaluation and then successful treatment but more so it allows our law enforcement officers to return to their other responsibilities as quickly as possible so sprinkled throughout our entire county more of these quick drop-offs uh, for those individuals is very much needed. In the correction system here in Maricopa County, the average length of stay is about 31 days. So for us, it's time. The uniqueness of an individual's needs can sometimes uh, require extensive treatment, uh, identifying it, coming out of the box in order to know what is it that we can do effectively. So the window for the sheriff's office and our detention staff, we go through the training and we provide as much as we can we rely on our correctional health services, um, that they are the ones that are uh, adequately um, formulating our action plans for us so that while we have these community members involved with our men and women in the jails, that we know how it is to address their needs and how to support the programs that are in place by the correctional health system. I looked today and this morning out of about 5,000 inmates, over 2,000 of them are on some sort of mental health um, medication system. So, but within our own psychiatric unit that we have, uh, we have a 300 bed unit and within the jail system, we only have about 100 individuals. Those other individuals are sprinkled throughout our system so that we can work in concert with correctional health services and their action plan to hopefully identify a successful way to move through the judicial system while they're incarcerated. And then the big thing that we do is we work on what we call the warm handoff so that those identified individuals when they are being released from custody, who is waiting for them at the release point, then to take over that action plan, working with our community partners. So it's been a supportive system through uh, uh, the correctional health system, but the biggest challenge is we have a short window in Maricopa County and our jail system in order to activate all of these resources, and we're getting better at it. Um, there's more improvement that can be done, but between our patrol response and what we do with within the jail systems, that's what we're, we're actively trying to do, but it all boils down to those quick times, mm -hmm. what's there and, and just trying to accomplish it and then move on to so many others that have needs. And Judge Welty. It's hard to pick one. Um, it, it, the, the mental illness ought to be addressed through treatment. Uh, the, there's four principles of the criminal justice system, uh, deterrence, retribution, incapacitation, and rehabilitation. Uh, almost, almost no rehabilitation is, has been meaningfully done for years. It's a system largely based around deterrence uh, and retribution. Deterrence and retribution are, are not factors that meaningfully apply to the behavioral health. It's like punishing somebody with a broken leg for finishing last in a race. Um, 
so I, you know, I think if, if I had to pick one, it would be um, we need to look at the amount of money we're spending in the criminal justice system doing uh, minimally effective mental health treatment and focus those resources toward mental health treatment in the community. We need meaningful and mandated programs for uh, diversion of cases pre-arrest and immediately post-arrest on accurate data gathering um, so that the seriously mentally ill are diverted to appropriate rehabilitation services before they go through a costly and unnecessary criminal justice. Well, and I, I would like to take an opportunity to commend you and your colleagues in Arizona's judiciary because, as, as you just said, um, addressing mental illness through criminal punishment is, is both inhumane and ineffective. And Arizona's courts... And, and, well, and grossly inefficient. I mean, even if you, if, if you, if you get very cold and, 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 and start talking about widgets, it's, it's, gro it's grossly more expensive to do this in the criminal justice system than it is to do it outside the criminal justice system. In terms of affording appropriate treatment? It's a, a, what do you guys have, 105 a day, 330 right. booking charge? That's correct, $105 a day for housing. Yeah, I bet, I bet you can do it cheaper. <laughs> so, and, and, and just to continue, I, the, the Arizona courts, in collaboration with prosecutors, law enforcement agencies, our social service agencies, have really been national leaders. And I, I do want to mention that uh, Chief Justice Brutnell, my successor, is on a national task force on the decriminalization of mental illness. And they're working hard. And uh, fortunately, in Arizona, people have been willing to experiment with new approaches and to collaborate across agencies. Now, Ms. Williams. So this piggybacks on an initiative that Access has been working on for several years, but I think it starts with having a behavioral health provider and a space for that provider at every public school in Arizona. You start normalizing seeing a behavioral health provider at a young age, you identify issues earlier, and you help prevent crises that adults are experiencing currently that these gentlemen are describing that end up in the courts. Well, that, that invites another question that I want to direct to both maybe you and Ms. Coons. Because I know that in the justice system, in our juvenile justice system, about 70% of the kids who get caught up are experiencing some kind of mental health issue. So maybe we ought to talk a little bit about the incidence of mental health issues with kids. What are we, what are we really facing? Well, you know, I, I think to kind of piggyback on some of this conversation is that what we see both with the adults and with juveniles is that oftentimes the first system they run into is the criminal justice system. Their families and then themselves don't know that they have a mental health struggle, that they have, um, that these symptoms equal something that needs help or treatment for. And so unfortunately the first system they get is the criminal justice system who may not be prepared to recognize what they're looking at and expecting that individual to be able to say, this is what I'm going through when they don't really have that clear understanding. It's only those that have a diagnosis that have that ability to create that historical um, narrative. And what I can, so at, at Teen Lifeline, we actually work with one of the juvenile detention centers where if any of their kids um, appear to be in crisis, they're given the opportunity to call in and talk to us. About 90% of those calls equal or end up with me talking to someone at the detention center about getting an emergency psyche eval because these children have never been evaluated and they are showing signs of significant mental health issues that have just never been seen, but also their families don't know what they're looking at. Or it's historic, there's genetic components, or their family has a history of mental health um, struggles that have never been treated. And so amazingly, we're able to get these kids, but not all detention centers do that. Not all, um, it, it really is about melding um, both the criminal justice system alongside those of us that are in the crisis system or the treatment systems and stuff so that there is better education, recognizing that that's not what the criminal justice system is for, but you are the first people that see them oftentimes and may be their only way back to being connected to the community that can get them healthy. 
And Ms. Williams, did you want to add? I would just add to that. You know, it's not, uh, we expect when we send our children to school that there's a school nurse. If they mm -hmm. fall down on the, on the playground and they break a limb, we expect that there to be people around to immediately help address that physical injury. We should have the same expectations for our children's mm -hmm. mental health. Mm -hmm. There should be someone on that campus that can help address if that child is dealing with anxiety and depression earlier on. That's really what we need. And we're thankful that uh, the state legislature has actually provided funding to access to try to create those relationships. We have about 16,000 children right now in Arizona who are receiving services through their, on their school campus through access. And we hope to just continue to watch those numbers expand. While some will see that as a sign of a mental health pandemic in our country, the way we look at it is that we are helping to address those issues earlier on and hopefully helping provide those children with a much healthier adulthood. Mm -hmm. And you're building resiliency. You're yes. teaching people at an earlier age how to handle problems because our world will never be without problems. We're teaching them how to manage and ask for help when their own mental health is struggling. And we're showing them that the community as a whole cares about them. And oftentimes, with the SRO and other people involved with that process on a school campus can, can create a completely different culture and trajectory for a child. And prior to the legislation, our state was looking at 900 kids for every school counselor. There is no way any person, no mental health professional, has the ability to provide the necessary support to 900 people. And Ms. Dominic. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm bursting here. Um, I w so many things I want to say. I want to focus this a little bit more uh, on the veteran population and active duty service members. So when we're talking about children of these service members and veterans, um, there's a, a misunderstanding of, of what's happening when mom or dad is deployed and what that feels like. So if we have a child who's, who's concerned, right, because you see things on TV and, and you don't know, and you have another child who may say, your dad's never going to come home. He's just going to die there. And what does that escalate? What does that become? And then knowing that um, I can reach out. Perhaps they're growing up in a family where um, they're not sure because mom may be the one that the parent at home right now and is also struggling, or it may be the opposite. Um, so that child sometimes moves into a position where they feel like I have to hold this together. Mm -hmm. and then they I have to be strong yes. for mom. Yes. Mom Ex or dad. Exactly. So I, I truly believe that taking care of this on the upstream part, when you have those support systems in place, it's like repairing a car. When you need new spark plugs, you get that taken care of. That car runs great. So when you put these, these opportunities in place for people who are struggling, it's the same thing. If I were to say to the people in the room right now, I have diabetes, I need to step away and give myself insulin, you know, people would nod their heads. If I say to you, I have a profound anxiety disorder, I'm anxious sitting here, you're like, oh. We have to change the message. So it's the whole body from toe to head. And we never want a child to feel like they're less than. I, I was not a particularly pleasant teenage girl. <laughs> um, so understanding what that is all like and then understanding what may also be underlying is a big deal. So if my dad's deployed and my mom just came back from her deployment and now I'm in a new school again, um, there's other stuff going on. And what support systems are in place to, to do that? So thank you for asking that question. Well, and, and thank you all. As you said, there are many points we could discuss, uh, but we've come to the end of the time for our program. I take from your remarks that beyond collaboration and resources, it's vitally important that we have greater public awareness and understanding, and I applaud your efforts in that regard, including by your participating in, in this session, and I invite the audience to join me in thanking the panelists for their remarks. And I'll yield to our MC, Mr. Williams. Thank you again. Thank you, Judge Bales. Thank you for that great moderated session. And thank you to our panelists. Uh, Judge Wealthy, I know you have a hard stop. So if you slide out before I finish my closing remarks, I, I will understand. Uh, just want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, I want to acknowledge it's just a few people here. Uh, uh, again, Chief Rod Bell, who's been with us throughout this entire 2020 series. Uh, Director Colonel Wright, who's with us today. Thank you 
former U.S. Air Force. We got the Air Force thing going on there. And uh, all of our police chiefs uh, for coming today to the mental health series. They've been there for the other series, Chief Walsh coming all the way out from Florence. Thank you for coming, chiefs and police law enforcement officials. Uh, also want to thank uh, Chaplain Dan Butler for being here with us today. He's always there when we need him. And um, uh, George Dean, still here from the president of the Urban League. Thanks, George Dean, for being here, sir. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think Charles Fennell is still here, Arizona State Conference, NAACP. Thank you for coming. And um, also Jeff Goldner, president of Arizona Public Service. Thanks, Jeff. You've always been there with us a lot of the activities that we get accomplished. So thank you to our sponsors, of course, uh, the Reverend uh, Karen Stewart for that wonderful invocation. Thank you for being with us, HB. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and of course, um, all of our guest speakers. We want to thank all of you for being with us today to share your talents. Um, and also, just so you all know, uh, if you want to see the future of brain performance, uh, we have Michael Southworth here with us and Lou Swartz. They actually have the, the, the Vitania mobile mental health unit system outside. Uh, I would encourage you to stop and take a peek inside and let them explain to you what that's about. Uh, I have the very fortunate occasion to be in the uh, program right now. I'm three months into the program uh, for brain performance. Uh, it helps with uh, brain performance, uh, PTSD, and all those things for our men or our military veterans. Uh, it's been a great help, and it's been a great help to me already in three months. So thank you guys for being here. Um, I just wanted to share that as we continue to get requests from across the country, the Heroes on the Foundation, we're actually headed next week to Indiana for a critical conversation uh, with their leaders. Uh, this entire 2020 series has been about time for change. We know that change takes effort. It takes a lot of effort. Our mantra has been not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. We know that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. We know that the best predict, uh, we must change our behavior on how we view and react to people with mental health issues. In support of the governor's proclamation of recognizing suicide prevention awareness, we decided to take on this important conversation. All of us must continue to make every effort to our fellow citizens in any way we can because history will be our friend or our foe. As long-term friendships have started to erode, by choosing sides as families have, taken out, have been taken out of their regular routine due to the pandemic, people have found themselves isolated. Isolation can be a good thing if that's what you choose. If isolation is not what you choose, it can be a major, have a major effect on your mental state. Actress Glenn Close shared that what mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversations. We need more of these conversations, and we will have more of these conversations. Remember this. The people that we see on the street with mental health issues were not always people on the street with mental health issues. Most of them were once contributing members of our society. They were you. They were me. They were us. You don't have to struggle in, you don't have to struggle in silence. Demi Lovato said, you can be unsilent. You can live well with a mental health condition as long as you open up to somebody about it. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you to our viewers on live stream across the country who joined us. We welcome your comments. God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America. If we can get a group photo of our panelists, if our panelists can stay for just a second, uh, and if any of you want to provide comments about today's session, see our production team. Thank you.